As Michael mentioned, I do have a newsletter, which I would encourage you all to subscribe to at AaronWren.com. And if you read all the archives, which you should, I wrote an archive one time where I made, I wrote a newsletter one time where I made the argument that men should not preemptively apologize when they haven't done anything wrong. And so I will not offer an apology, but I will tell you that I've had a terrible cold for the last week, uh, which has sort of affected my uh, preparation, and I'm still kind of a little bit under the weather. So if my voice sounds funny, that's what that is. <clears throat> for those of you who know me, you probably know me for an article I wrote in First Things Magazine in February last year called The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. And for those of you who don't, I'm just going to give a very quick synopsis of this article and what it was about. This article was basically about changes in how culture and society has viewed Christianity over the course of the last 50 to 60 years and in ways that evangelicals have responded to those cultural changes. And so I start off in the 1950s, which was the high watermark of church attendance in America, when about half of all Americans attended church every Sunday. Uh, Christianity, certainly Protestant Christianity specifically, was sort of softly institutionalized at the time. Uh, and yet in the 60s, mid-60s sometime, uh, I date it to the Kennedy assassination, the status of Christianity began to go into a decline in the United States that continues to this day. A decline in terms of church attendance, and decline in terms of belief in Christian truths, and declines in terms of the way that society reflected Christian moral principles. And this period of decline, uh, I divide into three periods that I call the positive, the neutral, and the negative world. The positive world is the period from 1964 to 1994, roughly, you can debate the specific years, in which Christianity is in decline. I want to be clear, this is not a time when things are all going well for Christianity, it is a time of decline, and yet Christianity is still basically viewed positively. To be known as a good church-going man makes you seem like an upstanding member of society, and Christian moral norms are still basically the moral norms of society, and you can get in trouble if you violate them. Around 1994, we hit a tipping point, and we enter what I call the neutral world. And this extends from 94 to 2014. And in the neutral world, Christianity is no longer viewed positively, but it's not really viewed negatively yet either. It's essentially one lifestyle choice among many in a pluralistic, multicultural public square. And in this era, Christian moral norms have eroded, but still sort of have residual force. And then around 2014, we hit a second tipping point, and we enter what I call the negative world, where for the first time in the 400-year history of America, Christianity is now viewed negatively, certainly skeptically, by elite secular society. Christian moral norms are expressly repudiated and, in fact, viewed as the threat to the new public moral order, the new public moral regime. And I think we can all sense that something has profoundly changed in America. Uh, you know, you can debate the particular year, but certainly sometime during President Obama's uh, second term. And it's caused a lot of people to kind of get thrown for a loop. So over this period of time, uh, Christian church attendance was going down, certainly in the mainline traditions that had dominated America. But evangelicals responded through three basic strategies. Uh, in, the so, uh, in the positive world, those strategies were the culture war strategy and the secret sensitivity strategy. And in a neutral world, that was what I call the cultural engagement strategy. So the culture war strategy is what we all know is essentially the religious right. These people saw Christianity going into decline, and they saw kind of the secular advance of the sexual revolution, and they said, we're going to fight back, we're going to mobilize politically, we're going to take back the country. So you can think of Jerry Falwell and Moral Majority. Moral Majority is like a positive world name, right? Like Nixon's Silent Majority, Pat Robertson, all these people. These were very highly confrontational against the culture. It was about the fighting with the culture. And that strand, of course, remains with us today. A sort of a second response to Christian decline came out of people like Rick Warren and Bill Hybels, uh, who started essentially the seeker-sensitive megachurch movement in the 1970s. So Bill Hybels, said, hey, people are turning away from stodgy old 
churches. They don't want these, you know, fuddy-duddy liturgies, and they don't want robes, and they don't want these hymns. They don't want organs. And so they created a sort of very seeker-friendly, consumer-friendly church in response. It's informal, contemporary music. It deals with topical concerns. It's very therapeutic, all those things. And, you know, at things like, say, Willow Creek, his church in suburban Chicago, and so this became, you can think, I think this in some respect represents the evangelical mainstream. Essentially the suburban non-denominational megachurch is basically what we're talking about here. And again, that continues through to this day as well. In the neutral world, um, there's the development of a third strategy called cultural engagement. Cultural engagement kind of developed in concert with the revival of the cities in the 90s under mayors like uh, Rudy Giuliani in New York. And you can think of uh, cultural engagement in terms of two, st- two things. You can think of it as a seeker sensitivity for the city. I think it had that kind of vibe to it. And it, you can also think of it as the opposite of the culture war. Rather than fighting with the culture, they want to get along with the culture, they wanted to engage with the culture. This is the neutral world. We have you know, a pluralistic public square. I say I'm a Christian, you say you're a vegan. Great, let's sit down at that table and have a conversation. Let's engage and have an open conversation and find the common ground and all of that stuff. And of course, I would say Tim Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church and much of the urban church movement, college town church movement falls into this cultural engagement model. Now again, these models are not everything. You you know, not everybody fits into them, but this is sort of the three main ones. And uh, there really hasn't been a model developed yet for the negative world, which I find interesting. The main model that's been articulated for that is Rod Dreher's Benedict Option. Now, he's Eastern Orthodox and formerly Catholic, and evangelicals basically didn't like the Benedict Option. Uh, but I think finding a new model that works in the negative world is the task before us, because what we're seeing is all these existing models, which are still here, and still actually have good things about them, are sort of coming under pressure and deforming under the pressures of the negative world, and it's causing this intra-evangelical conflict that we've now seen the culture war has gone from essentially the church kind of versus the world, now it's sort of evangelical versus evangelical. And so that's kind of a synopsis of the article. It's called The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. You could Google that, and it'll pull it right up, and you can read it in more detail. And so this is going to be a little bit of a wonky presentation. When I say wonky, it's in the word like policy wonk. I'm going to give you a lot of frameworks. And I already gave you two. Framework number one is the three worlds, positive, neutral, negative world. Framework number two is the three strategies for for this period of decline, culture war, secret sensitivity, cultural engagement. And the third model I want to give you, the third framework I want to give you, is another framework of talking about how the church and culture relate to each other. And this is probably the most famous framework of its type that has ever been written, and that is the Christ and culture model that was put forth by a theologian named H. Richard Niebuhr in his book of the same year, uh, same name in 1951. If you ever heard of uh, his brother Reinhold Niebuhr, is probably uh, uh, you know, more famous, but H. Richard Niebuhr was also extremely famous in his day. I think Reinhold Niebuhr was Barack Obama's uh, favorite theologian. Both of these guys were sort of mainliners, but they were sort of seen as kind of very mainstream, prominent religious commentators in society. This is that era of soft institutionalization. You could be a theologian and still be a public intellectual as well. And he wrote this book called Christ and Culture that gave essentially five timeless ways that Christianity and culture have uh, basically viewed each other. And he called these uh, Christ against culture, Christ of culture, Christ above culture, Christ in culture and paradox, and Christ transforming culture. And these are sort of ways that Christians have sought to reconcile reason and revelation. Uh, The natural law and God's law. So you can think of culture as, uh, we think of um, Christ as representing essentially the Bible, revealed truth. Culture is natural law, everything that kind of exists out there in society. How do we reconcile these sort of two sources of truth? And I'm not really gonna go into detail on this model, 
Uh, but I do want to just illustrate one of these to give you a sense of, of what it means. So one of his models is the Christ against culture model. And you might, when you hear that, you might naively think that what's this means? Oh, this is the culture war, right? This is people fighting against culture. No, what Niebuhr means by this is in the Christ against culture's war, a Christ uh, against culture model, we have a situation where everything is about Christ law, everything is about the Bible and Revelation, and everything outside of that is to be disregarded or superseded. And the example of someone who thinks this way is the Apostle John in the verse First John, like First John, paradigmatically, it's don't be don't be interested in the world, separate from the world, avoid getting tainted by the world. So in this case, culture is the world. Uh, another guy would be Tertullian, if you've heard of him. He's famous for a quip: "What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem?" What does Greco-Roman philosophy have to do with the word of God? What does you know, Roman society have to do with the life of the church? And people in this model, what you would do typically, or what you would tend to do is sort of withdraw from culture into essentially an attempt to create a more perfect Christian community. And Niebuhr's examples of this would be monks going into the monastery, or think of the Amish or these Anabaptist sects that are like, we're going to withdraw from the world into our own sort of perfectionist society. So I just use this as an example. These are the sorts of things Niebuhr talks about. So if you're ever interested in engaging with the topic of how the church and culture interact with each other, this is a book you essentially have to interact with because it's the most famous treatment. In fact, critics of my model said you didn't take into account everything Niebuhr said, and so he, he's looming large. His book's actually not that long. It's pretty easy to read. It's not super sophisticated. Um, and so that's kind of the third model, the third framework I want to have. And the reason I don't want to go into detail on this model is because someone else already took this model and sort of applied it to the present day. And that person is Tim Keller. Tim Keller's 2012 book, Center Church, which is his church planting model, has a very long section on Niebuhr and his models. And what Keller does is Keller um, takes the five models that Niebuhr came up with and created essentially four sort of contemporary, put it into a contemporary context. What does it mean to be like this today? How would we describe it today? And he came up with essentially four models. This is the last framework I'm gonna give you. Uh, but his four models were transformation, relevance, counterculture, and two kingdoms. So what he called you know, Christ the Christ against culture model, which I just described, to him, that is the counterculture model. And you can think of the new monastics or people like that who wanted to essentially create new forms of, of, of Christian community in the modern day. Christian counterculture is the Christ against culture uh, model. Uh, the Christ of culture and the Christ above culture models, which we don't need to go to, Basically, Keller says those are models that he called relevance. And so what are examples of things that are about relevance? And he put the megachurch model. And people like Hybels and Rick Warren, their goal was to be relevant to the culture. And if you attend one of these churches, the sermons are very much often about sermon. They're, they're sermons that are literally relevant to your life. The last time I attended one of these, it was a sermon about how to manage your Facebook usage. You know, and how to, how to like you know, be wise in your use of social media. That's sort of like a very relevant topic. These people are very relevant. He would say the mainline churches tried to be very relevant. They tried to embrace current science and thinking of that nature. It's an attempt to be relevant. The um, Christ transforms culture, he says, of course, it's the transformational model. And what is transformation? His examples would be sort of like Abraham Kuyper and neo-Calvinism, if you're familiar with that, it was sort of an early 20th century model. And he put essentially the religious right in the transformationist model. The idea is to use politics to transform culture to align with Christ. And then his last uh, example was based on Christ and culture and paradox, which he said leads to two kingdoms philosophy. Is anybody in here Lutheran by any chance? Lutherans hold to essentially a two kingdoms philosophy and where you're a citizen of both the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom. There's also a, a, a modern ref, uh, reform two kingdoms movement promoted by people like Dave Van Drunen. 
Um, and I'm not going to go too much into this, but it's, but it's a niche. But these are, the, these are sort of four, applying near, these are like four ways a church could choose to engage with a culture. Transformation, relevance, counterculture, and two kingdoms. And I would say uh, Niebuhr's model is really more about theology. What does your theology tell you about how, as the church, we should view the culture? I think for both Keller and myself, the questions are more practical. And they're sort of like business strategies. These are the four business strategies um, you could use. And so I had three, I laid out three business strategies and Keller laid out four kind of archetypes of business strategies. And so if you look at my three, my three strategies, the culture war is clearly a transformationalist strategy in Keller's model. Seeker sensitivity is very clearly a relevance strategy in Keller's model. And cultural engagement, I argue, is also a relevance strategy, primarily a relevance strategy, although often with sort of transformationalist aspirations. But uh, even though some of the uh, in the city, for the city people do have this idea of like bringing shalom to the city and transforming, it's primarily a relevance type model. And if you go back and listen to the way Keller talked about how they planted Redeemer Presbyterian Church, it was very much about how do we create a language that's gonna resonate with secular New Yorkers. And so here's my, I told you all that to tell you this. My argument is this, that in the negative world, the evangelical church needs to rebalance away from relevance and transformation towards being a counterculture. Now what I'm saying there, I, I'm gonna be clear that I'm saying we need to rebalance, not abandon, okay? So meaning don't abandon trying to be relevant to people in the Great Commission, don't abandon engagement in politics, but we need to be much more conscious of the need to be a counterculture. We need to think of ourselves in a very different way uh, and even think about relevance in a different way. The truth is we're not going to transform the culture in the near term, most likely. We're not just one election away from setting everything right, although of course elections are important and politics are important. And this idea of trying to you know, sync up with where the man on the street is at works for some people, but realistically, there are now critical gulfs that separate the church from the man on the street. Because in order to become a Christian today, unlike in, say, 2000 or 1990 or 1980, uh, you have to uh, take on beliefs that are very low status, could get you potentially fired from your job, many other things. It's not just uh, what I call putting a, a better foot forward. And so, uh, if you think about winsomeness, I think originally uh, this conference was gonna be called something like Beyond Winsomeness, and I don't know if that's true, uh, but I think that we end up with what I, they're essentially what I would call two definitions of winsomeness and the way we could think about winsomeness. Definition number one of winsomeness is something that flows from who you are and who you aspire to be. What kind of person, how do I like to interact? I mostly am a winsome person in terms of how I like to interact. I'm low conflict, I don't like to fight with people. You know, I don't wanna be doing that. I would like to have substantive discussions. The second definition of wisdom is winsomeness, and I think this is what, uh, for a lot of people, this is how winsomeness functions. Winsomeness is a strategy of relevance. Winsomeness is a rhetorical style or approach or a language that you adopt in order to be relevant to the unbeliever on the street and gain a hearing for the gospel. It is along with, it's sort of like, well, we're gonna get rid of the organ and we're gonna get the guitar and we're gonna get rid of the hymns. We're gonna go with this contemporary music. We're not gonna make you wear a suit anymore. All that stuff that Bill Hybels did. We're gonna preach about Facebook. We're gonna have good children's programming. All good stuff, by the way, nothing wrong with that. But the point is, that's all like, how do we like kind of sync up? Those are the relevant strategies. And I say, we should not view ourselves as 
bound and imprisoned by that relevance model in the negative world. And we should be much, which, again, I think the, 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 the relevance model was very much about syncing up with the average person on the street in terms of secular lifestyles, language, aspirations, et cetera. And if we no longer need to pander to the average person, uh, who is frankly not someone who is actively seeking for the most part, you know, at least not in the same ways before, we are now free to think about how do we speak. And I, I don't gonna tell you exactly how we should do that, but we should think, and if, but I would suggest that if we are going to be more of a counterculture, then our speech from the pulpit in the way we should engage should very, very heavily be driven by how it is going to be perceived by the people who are Christian. Is it going to edify them, build them up, equip them to live in a world where it's going to be costly to follow Christ? Uh, and this is where we might end up with something like James Wood, the theologian, has talked about clarity. We need to have more clarity, maybe, in our speech. Less winsome, more clear. That doesn't have to mean provocative. It doesn't have to mean gratuitously offensive. But saying, hey, this is what the world believes. But we don't believe that. Here's what we believe. Here's why we believe what we believe. And here's why we don't believe what the world believes. And... I think we really have to, um, to really equip our people, our children. If I think about, uh, you know, especially like kids growing up Jewish. At some point, that family's got to explain what Christmas is and why they don't celebrate it and why they don't have a Christmas tree in their house and a wreath on the door. And we are now going to have to do all of those things. We are not, obviously, a minority in the sense that Jews are a minority, but in this negative world, our language is going to have to be much more directed at our own people, primarily for the consumption of our own people and, and creating a counterculture uh, that can sustain itself in the negative world. It could be more clear and more distinctively Christian, I think. Uh, and I think it might actually ultimately end up being more missional for that effect. As we've seen, if you look at someone like Jordan Peterson, why does he appeal to men? Because he's willing to say things that other people won't sometimes. He'll make statements, uh, highly controversial statements like, girls aren't attracted to boys who are their friends, whatever that means. They're attracted to boys who win status competitions with other boys. That's what I call news you can use, right? And that's very, like, you know, I mean, man, what, what, are we telling our, what are we telling our teenage boys about what girls are interested in? All they want a servant leader. It's not true, by the way. So, you know, we, you know I think that, like, you know, the, the fact that people went to a guy like Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Andrew Tate, um, I don't think we need to adopt their, their content, their language, et cetera, but it shows that actually when you kind of give up on the idea of being missional through relevance, you can be missional through other ways, even if you're not strategically uh, intending. And so I would just say, your rhetoric at the end of the day flows from your strategy or how you conceptualize your strategy. And evangelicals have primarily conceptualized their strategies in terms of relevance. Primarily in terms of relevance and uh, to some extent in terms of transformation. And my argument, may not be your argument, is that we need to strengthen our counterculture genes and start having a rhetoric that flows out of counterculture, not to, the, again, not to the, you know, the abandonment of the Great Commission or engaging in politics or social activism, but something that strengthens us so that we can maintain uh, a distinctly Christian uh, church, distinctly Christian family, distinctly Christian lives in this negative, hostile world where there's kind of no escape from uh, the, the risk of getting uh, hit by the eye of Sauron or something. So that, that to me is the, that's the strategic justification for a change in rhetoric, is that the times have changed and we are not in a time when the relevance model is as relevant as it used to be. So thanks.
Oh, wherever. I'll sit in the middle because they wanted to do by height. Can you sit on the end here? I'll sit right here. That works. If our other panelists could join us up at the table. Who are we missing? Oh, Michael Foster, yes. All right. Aaron, thank you for that. That was helpful. How many people here were familiar with the three worlds framework that Aaron just outlined? So it looks like a little more than half the room, or at least the ones who are conscious and willing to raise their hands. Um, <laughs> that's good. I'm tired after lunch, too. Camp Washington chili, not Indian food for me. Um, so that, that framework's very helpful. So I, I've worked uh, negative world into some of these questions. So just understand that's what I'm referring to here when I ask you guys about the negative world. So first question, this is for anybody at all. Microphones are in front of you. Assuming we're in the negative world as regards Christianity, is there a competing worldview for which America is currently the positive world? Or is there no single identifiable worldview that is viewed positively? Uh, I, I would suggest the neo-Marxist uh, narrative of oppressor versus oppressed would be generally viewed positively in the main institutions governing this country. And so that will be a point of contention which Christians need to wrestle with in their rhetoric in terms of exposing it as a very bad thing. So I would say in general, institutionally, you know, talking about academia, the media, um, I was just thinking last night about hockey, which is a very masculine, you know, sport, even though I don't prefer it because it's Canadian mainly, but hey. sorry, Mike. <laughs> Um, no, it's very, I mean, you got guys skating around hitting each other, like, and then all of a sudden you got rainbow flags all over the show. And so, like, even a sport like hockey is being colonized by this worldview that is uh, completely atheistic and all based on lies. So, so follow-up question on that. Assuming that's true, if, and that sounds plausible, that some form of neo-Marxism is the competing worldview that's viewed positively, in the positive world in the 50s and 60s, people would have been, uh, they would have welcomed the label Christian, right? So the world viewed it positively, and I could say explicitly, I'm a Christian, whereas New Marxism, we're still, that word Marxist still has enough of a negative flavor that people aren't gonna own the label, even if the philosophy is viewed positively. Um, is that, does that sound right to you guys? Is Neo Marxism, there's some form of that, cultural Marxism, the, the actual, flavor of the day? I think it's the dominant um, ideology that's being pushed. I wouldn't necessarily say it's among your average person that they want to be labeled that. I would say something, um, I would say liberalism is probably still pretty dominant for most average people. And that, that comes with kind of a, you know, kind of live and let live is still pretty uh, dominant. And that's why we've been so reluctant to confront this. Because um, a lot of people just aren't, it hasn't touched their lives yet. And so I'm hopeful that once it does, because it's being pushed so hard, that there will be a, a bit of a backlash. Can you define liberalism for us, just in case those of us who don't? <laughs> in two words or less. No, um, <laughs> just the, the kind of, I, the. I guess the best way to think about it is, is the kind of the idea of the neutral uh, civic you know, space, that there is no dominant, you know, we shouldn't push any one um, ideology over another. And it's that, that, you know, as these opposing ideologies are becoming so dominant, you know, we're reluctant to put forward a competing ideology because we just want, hey, just leave us alone. Just, we can't we just all you know agree to just abide by this this liberal set of you know free speech and you know set of ideals that we're, we're um, we used to take for granted um, yeah I don't know Does but you're asking a question about labels a lot of times the label that sticks is the one that your enemies ascribe to you um, so Marxist 
to say that is often from a conservative who's trying to pejoratively label somebody in a negative way. Christian is a label that we wear, period, whether it's good or bad uh, in the perception. But woke is a word that is used pejoratively by some. It used to be a positive thing came from coming from the black, uh, you know, black African Americans. But now it's become more of a pejorative that conservative-minded people will ascribe to them. So I think the, there may not be a, a particular label that we could say, here is the spirit of the age, but there are certain patterns of speech. Um, like we, diversity is, if, we, if you put diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you put those three words together, conservatives see red flags. Nevertheless, in typical conversation, we might casually talk about, it's like, well, you know, I'm looking for a diverse this or that. Or, you know, we want, we want to be inclusive of, of people of this or that. And th that language peppered into our discourse shows us what is the real spirit of the age. And even conservative, Bible-believing Christians that would reject Marxism as a label will still parrot the same talking points. That's good. So does the other side uh, have better PR than us? I mean, have they been able to avoid some of the pejoratives that we haven't as Christians? They have the power to shape PR. Have you guys seen that Bud Light campaign? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. Uh, should the church be explicitly teaching its people specific ways to live in the negative world? So I'm, I'm assuming there that we all agree with the framework. It seems to bear out in our own day-to-day -day lives, I think. Should we be teaching our regular people explicit ways to survive in it and thrive in it? It is the responsibility of pastors to bring the word of God to bear on the people in front of them in the place they live, in the time they live. So wherever you're at, so negative world, positive world, Africa, US. So the answer is yes. So yeah, they absolutely should be uh, giving the best wise counsel they can, right? Yeah, I'd, uh, I, I'd, ag I'd agree with that to the extent that pastors and churches are talking about things that are sort of rooted in their domain of the Bible. I think one of the things that the evangelical world has gotten in trouble is when these pastors start coming up with like life coaching strategies like purity culture. Or you take something like I kiss dating goodbye and to what extent is that in the Bible? Well actually some of it is rooted in the Bible. You can't have sex before you get married. You shouldn't do that. You, should, you know you shouldn't move in with your girlfriend. So I think there are certainly areas where we can be directive. I think there are other areas where pastors specifically should be cautious about being directive because it's a matter of wisdom or prudence or many other things. And, uh, you know, somebody, you know, well, you need, you need to move to a small town and, and go homestead and somebody does that, it's a disaster, then you've sort of discredited Christianity, I think, as somebody said in their mind. So what, what I believe is with that is we need to have way more kind of lay experts operating in a kind of a lay mode it, you know, uh, talking about things like entrepreneurship or, um, you know, strategies for where to live, you know, health and fitness, uh, relationships, things where, you know, Jordan Peterson's like a, a psychologist. We should have a Christian psychologist who's just as knowledgeable about the psychology literature as Jordan Peterson and can talk just as authoritatively about it. Instead, everything's been relied on pastors to do everything. It's like some pastors or some like, generalist kind of writer types, um, you know, to, who kind of like free, freestyle on this stuff, and it's often like not very good uh, because they aren't people actually, actually aren't experts in anything they're saying. So I, I do think we only need to be cautious about where the lines are. So I would say yes, the church, and that the church is made up of all these people. We, do, we need to bring the full spectrum of expertise together, not just say the pastor needs to tell you how to structure your life to live in this world. He can't do that for you. You know, you have to figure that out. Uh, yeah, and I would just back up what Michael Foster said last night regarding wisdom, the, the pastor's job, and I think a lot of pastors avoid this because once you start trying to tease out the Word of God and applying it like, like most of the Puritans did really well, and you try to give people may, maybe some direction, spiritual direction and guidance in their life, that gets the pastor in a bind very quickly. If he hasn't thought through the things, or if he's speaking to not just one-sidedly, but too myopically instead of holistically. And when we read the Word of God, we see a wide range of options 
for operating in this kind of environment. And so I think that's why wisdom literature, and I think that's what someone like Peterson offers a lot of people, wisdom isn't just thoughts. It's, it's actual, on the ground, uh, lived out faith. And so I think pastors have a huge opportunity to speak into that space. Um, Michael Clary, I know you've talked a lot about patterns with me in, in the pulpit uh, and in writing. Uh, pastors and theologians and Christians being able to identify patterns in creation. Um, so understanding what Aaron says that we don't want to uh, act, we don't want to as pastors act like we have more authority in an area than we actually do. How do we thread the needle of living by that and not acting like we're experts in something we're not while also recognizing that I don't have to have necessarily a chapter and verse to tell you it's not a great idea, young lady, to focus on your career till you're 37 and then get married. Uh, have you found any ways to thread that needle well? I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, so I, I think you start with the, the scripture does, gives us principles that we apply in our day-to-day -day experience. Some of those principles are taught directly, prescriptively in the Bible. Um, husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands. That is a prescriptive thing that is also reflected in creation. So you see the husband, uh, men are bigger, uh, stronger, faster, more aggressive. Those are things that correspond to leadership. Women tend to be more agreeable. Um, they're not as big, they're not as strong, not as fast, they're more nurturing. That tends to uh, associate with being helpers. You see that taught in scripture, so that's truth, capital T. And then you see patterns of creation, natural law, that would be more truth with a lowercase t. Doesn't have the same authority as scripture, but those are things that we can look around, like what are men generally like? What are women generally like? How do we apply the prescriptive patterns, themes, principles that we see in scripture in our day-to-day -day circumstance? So if it gets all the way to the granular level where we say, um, Wife, if you do X, Y, Z, you are in sin. Well, that, if, if, it's, if it is a clear sin, sure, but a lot of times it's prescriptive in a way that isn't clear sin, but it is treated as though this prescriptive thing has the same weight of scripture, but it isn't actually written in the Bible. Um, so here's an example you mentioned about, so if a woman were to go to college and you know, get a job, start a career, there are some things we could say, well, you need to be thinking about some of these things because principles that are uh, taught explicitly in Scripture, and you pointed this out, Aaron, the, some of the things that are more just obvious from, from the way men and women are. Um, women have a biological clock. That window of fertility is open for a certain period of time. There are things that men find attractive and that what men and women find attractive in one another that doesn't scale the same way over time. So there are things that we have to take into account. And so me as a pastor, I have tried to wade into that before and I've gotten a lot of pushback on it, but I think it was still the right thing to do. Whenever, so we're in a college neighborhood, uh, a lot of young women just starting college uh, coming here. If I, if I see a starry eyed 17, 18 year old young woman, I meet her in a new member class and she says, yeah, I'm getting ready to head to med school after I do my undergrad. I wanna say, here are some things you wanna think about. When you're 28 and you're, you've got 100 grand in debt and you're about to start your career, how's that gonna play out with your children? Have you thought about children? Have you thought about marriage? And a lot of times they're assuming something in the abstract. I haven't really thought about that. Or I'm sure marriage and family will come along eventually. Have you thought about how your opportunities shrink over time? Have you thought about um, the level of attractiveness that you will have to a man if you are going to be a career woman starting out with 100 grand in debt? Those things matter. People get really pissed when you talk about it, but those are things that are real world, tangible, concrete realities that people have to think through. So I'm not gonna say, you're in sin, you should not do that, that's wrong, but I'm gonna say, Wisdom has got to have a, a very loud voice in that decision. And I would imagine you'd advocate lay people doing the same. If an older woman in your church who's not necessarily a pastor sees a woman making a decision like that, yeah, have the same. Okay. I had a member <clears throat> get really frustrated with me and I just wouldn't tell him what to do. And it was like, well, uh, it's not my job. And 
And I think we live in a time where people grew up in broken families without fathers or without mothers in some cases as well. And so they didn't, they didn't get that sort of instruction from a mom and dad. So they want, you'll hear pastors refer to themselves as fathers. We're fatherly in the sense that we have authority, nurture, and care, all that stuff. We're not fathers in the same sense as a natural father is. I'm not, to congregants, I'm not their natural dad. I'm a spiritual father to them. And we don't want to confuse those two things. And I think you see that happen. And I see a lot of people wanting pastors to make decisions for them. But my job is to raise them into maturity and help them take responsibility for themselves and make decisions. And you can give them some feedback and give them counsel and show them stuff in scripture. But, uh, you know, when you start telling people what to do, you got to take responsibility. And, and that's kind of what they want to do. That's the bad part of the congregant a lot of times is that they don't want to take responsibility for themselves. And so if you don't, if I don't know, one of my favorite, I just say, I don't know. Like, I have no clue. And it's crazy what people think you know and what you think about. I get m emails, messages all day. What do you think about this? And I just said, don't. Don't think about that. You know, um, <laughs> what's your view on if we go to war with Russia and there's nuclear war? I guess I'd die. <laughs> I mean, that's my view. Like, what am I going to do? But, um, but people are looking for us to give answers. What we need to do is teach them how to get wise. Because they're just behind the eight ball. They don't, you know, I, I had to learn things in my uh, 30s I should have known in my 20s. And, and just, yeah, you're behind the eight ball. It's going to take a while to learn. And so I do think it is a danger. Pastors, to some degree, are general practitioners. Right? We do do that because we, we help people birth, death, tragedies, marriage. Um, you get put into a lot of inheritance disputes. That happens a whole lot. Um, so we do have to be knowledgeable, but we have to be very careful in how far. But I think prepping people in general, which is how I took the question, mm -hmm. uh, for the time we live in is something pastors need to think through. But it shouldn't come out in every single sermon either, right? That, like, don't give them red meat all the time. Just every once in a while. Yeah. The thing, um, too, when we expect that much of pastors to, you've got to have an answer on this, is oftentimes they take their, they feel that responsibility to provide an answer, so they turn over to the Gospel Coalition, <laughs> yeah. do a Google, and send a, a thing. <laughs> no one actually do that. And and so we end up with this, it, it's this kind of circular thing where the, the same people are talking to everybody, and there's not any like individual shepherding of, you know, people where they're at and being taught to how to think through these things. We need to give people a framework on how to make these decisions, not just take off the shelf arguments that were honestly, you know, especially when with COVID and stuff, those were rushed out because the church has got to say something. There was no thought put into the love your neighbor thing. That was a, a quick off the shelf thing that a bunch of pastors were being, they were caught deer in the headlights and they, uh, gospel coalition, yes, love your neighbor. And we've got, to get, we've got to get beyond that into thinking. Yeah, and I think, uh, I don't think I'm disagreeing with my fellow panelists here, but I do think pastors need to take responsibility for how what poorly we've been educated on certain matters in our seminaries. So an example would be like, if a congregant comes to me and goes, which economic policy is most Christian? I'm probably not going to answer that question, but I am going to equip that congregant on a biblical understanding of wealth and economics. And I think the word of God is very comprehensive in how it deals with God's word or God's world that he made. And so I think that I, I agree we have a lane and a responsibility to stay in. We do certain activities. But I also think that some pastors use that as an excuse not to speak more comprehensively about the world and how we can think about immigration or something like that, where we actually can go to the word of God and we can deduce certain principles and act wisely. We may disagree at the end of the day as far as how that practically plays <coughs> out, but I think that a lot of pastors have been so ill-equipped with a very pietistic Christianity and really pragmatic version of church leadership that uh, the Word of God is great and it's comprehensive, and this is where I lean a little bit theonomic, where I'm like, God, God's Word and God's law gives, gives wonderful principles in the Old Testament for, for how he wants his people to behave and operate in unity and harmony together. So, That's good. To make the uh, concepts a little more concrete, can any of you think of a, a denomination, a church, Christian institution that is navigating the negative world in a particularly good way? I mean, that you see some fruit from. No. Okay. Wait, a church 
a church, denomination, or Christian institution, higher ed, anything like that, that's navigating this negative world that we're in particularly well, bearing some fruit. NSA does okay with the negative, when their ad campaigns, they play into it a little bit. So if you're gonna go that broad. What's NSA? Uh, New St. Andrews in Moscow. Mm -hmm. But I don't, it's hard for me to think of a denomination. I say, oh, that's, that's the way. I think we're all, it's kind of to the end of the part of Aaron's talk I heard, is that we're, we're really figuring this, we're still figuring this out, it's pretty early on. Yeah, yeah. I, Aaron, if I remember right, you brought up at County Go for Country two years ago, Moscow. Am I remembering right, does that ring true with you? Yeah. Uh, do you remember any of what you said? I feel like you, you gave some good they were doing and then you also well, had some. I, I think, um, you know, I, if you look at my taxonomy, I would put the Moscow, Idaho people in, what, in the culture war model. I think that that was kind of their DNA. I think that's where they've come from. Uh, having said that, I think that they, um, they do a lot of tremendous things out there. I mean, one of the most impressive communities I've seen in terms of, uh, you know, they're located in the, uh, Moscow, Idaho is the state college town of Idaho. So the University of Idaho is there. It's, the town is 25 people, of which like 10 or 12,000 is probably the school. Uh, and, you know, they own a good chunk of the real estate on the town's main street. I mean, I, I don't think any conservative Christian churches own any uh, real estate out there in front of the University of Cincinnati. I mean, that's, that's pretty remarkable. And uh, they've built a very impressive media company, can impress. They've built real businesses out there. Uh, so in terms of, you know, what I call ownership, they've really done a good job of acquiring ownership, which is one of my themes for the negative world is, you know, you can't rely on uh, other people like letting you use their platforms and use their infrastructure as much as you used to because it's not neutral. And so you have to have more ownership over your, over your life and over the things that you, that are you depend on. Not that we can ever get anywhere close to 100% self-sufficient, but they've done a very good job on ownership. Uh, nevertheless, I'd say their style and their, their, their mode is very, very much in the culture war mode. And to add to that, so I have an office in Moscow. Canon Press is my publisher. They just released It's Good to Be a Man today on Canon Plus. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's my denomination that I belong to as well. So why did I name them? Uh, well, one reason is, is it, we're talking about a model here. Does that, does that translate? Yeah. You know, that's so uh, small, college towns like that are a particular type of ecosystem. And I, 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 I hear people say, I want to create a Moscow, Idaho. Well, it took 50 plus years and a whole lot of weird things to happen. And, and Doug's father played a major role in that. Um, I, I just don't, I don't know a model of someone that's like really identified a really good model yet that kind of translates well to multiple um, areas, or even just, we're trying to figure it out in Batavia, but I don't, what we're doing, I don't, don't so know how well it, we, I don't know how well it would work here. You know? Yeah, fair to say we could be encouraged by what Doug's been able to accomplish out there with his help, but not necessarily be able to replicate it the way he did it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, how much, as we as we look at political uh, involvement, how much should we be looking for co-belligerence in our political engagement, and how much should we be carrying out? explicitly Protestant Christian convictions with us into the, into the political square. I'm thinking a little bit Ron DeSantis, if I remember right, as a committed Roman Catholic. I'm not gonna feel bad about voting for him in 2024 if he gets the, but should we, should we be looking for guys like that and not as concerned with whether or not they have confessional Protestantism or? I think both. I don't think we need to let our co-belligerency soften what we stand for. Um, you know, on the trans ideology stuff, there's a very strong push to sever the T from LGB. And um, does that mean I'm not gonna share, you know, any, anything that's posted by gays against groomers or others that are fighting this fight? No, if it's helpful content, I, I may share that. But I'm not going to stop, you know, saying what the Bible teaches about biblical sexuality just because I have some allies that are um, LGB and fighting the T with me. Uh, similarly, 2020 kind of revealed. Michael and I have talked about this. Michael Clary and I have talked about this. We we found ourselves. Uh, 
with some co-belligerence on the charismatic side, the more Pentecostal side, when it came to issues of uh, meeting and, and you know, not shutting down our churches for a year. Uh, how much, as we're looking around, should Reformed theology, should that play as much a role in figuring out who our friends are in 2023 as it did 15 years ago? Or should we, should we give a little more wiggle room on that and look for more worldview similarities or... What do you mean, like, Reformed soteriology? Yeah, Reformed Reformed soteriology. We're Baptists, so we're not, you know, really Reformed, but... (laughs) True. No, I look forward to a day when Presbyterians can persecute Baptists again politically. (laughs) That's going to be a... That means we've won. Um, No, I don't think Reformed theology needs to be the litmus test for our alliances at this time. Uh, It was a neat uh, season of life for the last maybe 20 years where Reformed theology was useful in some ways, but it was also very dumbed down and stripped of a lot of other ideas. So I think uh, you said it. Uh, I'd, I can work with an Arminian with two eyes in his head and can see what's going on more than I can work with a Calvinist who's got a soteriology in line, in line but is blind. Yeah. And so I think that there's a great opportunity, like we both have talked about, uh, to work with other churches who are, and that, like I called a meeting with some pastors in our town and had a philosophy prof, prof uh, come up and share with us. And just hearing all of us, even though, I mean, some of them, dare I say, they have uh, women on their staff that are pastors. Another uh, is very much not uh, going to publicly be conservative, right? Didn't do anything when Roe got overturned from the pulpit. Yet all of us at the table could see transgender ideology as a major problem in our public mm-hmm. school district in the area. And so on those particular issues, even though I'm the type of person, unlike Aaron, who's uh, happy, to, happy to argue, happy to kind of be a contrarian, and so I'm willing to tell them, I think that's stupid that you have women pastors. And like, here's a beer, you know? And I, that just doesn't bother <laughs> me as much, but, they, but we can still work together uh, in a town like ours. So I think there's great opportunity for that. Is that context specific, you being in like a, a liberal state, fairly liberal town? Is that perhaps yeah maybe in Dallas or maybe somewhere else that's not as far gone? uh, It maybe don't need to employ that strategy, but for us it's uh, it's kind of a defensive position we've taken to cross party lines, so to speak, in that way. So many of our coalitions are formed around what are the needs of the hour. So when when COVID came along and there were really Mike, we were talking about this at lunch. how in Canada, there were, who were the people that he could lock arms with about the most pressing issue facing him? He might have to lock, he's not gonna be like, well, I'm not gonna partner with you to help keep our churches open because you know, you're only a four point Calvinist and I'm a five. Well, it's like, well, the need of the hour demands a coalition to be built and established for the purpose of what, what you're fighting, what you're trying to accomplish. During the Reformation, soteriology was the issue. So Reform's soteriology has had a long legacy for 500 years because of our departure from the Catholic, uh, the Catholic doctrine of soteriology. But now there are other issues that might require us to take our soteriological convictions and not set them aside, but that's not the thing that is going to be the rallying cry. And there are new rallying cries right now that are forcing us in a very weird way to it's, it's almost like denominations cut this way and our modern issues cut this way. And we're having to be like, well, you're not in my denomination, but some of you, it's like in every denomination, some people are, are more pro-gay, uh, anti-gay, to use shorthand. Which one are you? I'm, 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 not gonna, I'm not gonna disclose that here because I wanna be winsome, I don't wanna offend anyone. So we'll keep that to myself. But, that, but if we, we have to, we're responding in, in some measure, we're responding to the needs of the hour. Uh, caution on that. Um, to, I, co-belligerence, it can really burn you too, uh, who you connect with. I, I think a lot about the founding of the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And so guys like Mason and Carl McIntyre, when they came together, uh, McIntyre was much more of a fundamentalist than uh, in, in the way that we kind of think about that mm-hmm. word. Um, as opposed to Mason was more of a, a, a typical Northern Presbyterian. Yeah. Um, and that, that all broke down really quick, right? That coalition did within about a year or so, Jason Weber could correct me, but it was quick. And so uh, I think it's just gonna, you have to ask like, what are we uniting on? How close, how formalized, all that sort of stuff. 
And so, I, so you got Mormons out there attacking feminism, saying some good things. Um, so when they're doing that, they let them do their thing. You know, I just, I'll stay out of the way. You know, uh, let, yeah, go, go attack it. Or it's like if the Roman Catholics are down in the abortuary, down in the abortion clinic, and they're not just counting their stupid beads, and they're actually talking to the people, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop it. I'm not gonna stop them there either. Um, but there's only, and I'm willing to share a stage if it's clear that the stage is a forum, right? Like a TED Talk where people can share different ideas, right? The purpose is there are different standpoints up there. But if the stages were all on the same team, well then that, that changes things. Yeah. Or, and so I think what we need to do is be less, uh, understand that whatever your tribe was, they get all broke up. And that's, those aren't things that, that they're reforming right now. And we're figuring out where these lines drop and uh, so I just think, again, I hate to be annoying like this, but it does, it's one of those wisdom discernment, yeah. you know, because, um, for example, I've had people come to my church and just tell me that I'm not hardcore, hardcore enough about masculinity. Um, I don't talk about it every week. I was like, well, that's because we teach you the Bible. You literally wrote the book. A book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, or we've had people that come out that we're not homestead enough, right? Well, it's like the homestead's not a principle in our church. Right, um, homestead is uh, how to get a five thousand dollar egg. Right, I mean that's what it really is. So you keep your kids busy, but um, but you don't want to form coalitions like you. Those secondary affinities are powerful to do things, but uh, this is really hard to build anything that that's stable and long term out of it. And that's giving me more and more pause as I move forward. Yeah, I, I have a, a, a few ways to slice this. Number one is, if you go back to that 50s time frame, people were very institution loyal uh, in general, denomination loyal. So you probably wouldn't see a lot of Presbyterians and Lutherans getting married, much less Protestants and Catholics getting married. Well, institutional loyalty has been in decline, and today it's very much about what I call affinity groups. Everything's moving to an affinity group model, birds of a feather, online communities, et cetera, uh, tribes, networks, whatever you want to call them. But it's basically, I want to find my people and hang out with my people, which my people is not defined, it's defined by variables that would not have been defined by in the past, which is institutional membership in a Presbyterian church, uh, for example. I think that this, I think we, we all operate this way because that's who we are. This is an expression of the modern concept of the self where Here's my self-expression, my self-identity, and I want to surround myself with other people who express that way, mm -hmm. as opposed to, a, you know, we're all stuck in this Presbyterian church here, and we got to figure out how to, like, get along, because this is where we are. We're all Presbyterians, and we've all been in this church for four generations. And so I think there's, like, a we the weakness of the affinity group approach uh, is that we are, um, we're essentially, it's a completely modern, we're expressing the modern concept of self. Secondly, uh, in a co-belligerent model, you end up with, are you really, uh, uh, who's leading this alliance? So in political conservatism, and I worked for a conservative think tank for many years, like political conservatism, and you know, lots of people said this, is basically a Catholic Jewish project. You know, from the standpoint of Christians in uh, political conservatism, it is Catholic normative. William F. Buckley Jr. was a Catholic, there were a lot of Catholics in there. There's still a ton of Catholics. And wow, if you're going to be you know, voting Republican and support, supporting all these organizations, you're basically supporting something where it's always going to be Catholic dominated. And you know, at a certain level, they're conscious of it being Catholic dominated. And you know, you're not going to be the brains. There's this quip, Rusty Reno gave this quip on a podcast I was on one time. He's like, the Chuck Colson had told Richard John Newhouse Colson, of course, evangelical, did prison fellowship. Newhouse, the Catholic convert, editor of First Things. You supply the ideas, we supply the votes. And that's, that's what's happened. And a lot of people essentially end up dumb followers of people that are not setting the agenda. Uh, so that's one thing I'd say is, you know, are, are, you, are they your co-belligerents or are you their co-belligerents? Yeah. That's one thing I, I'd say. Um, and then the last thing, I think that these distinctives are actually important um, at, at foundational levels to your view of the world. 
And one of the things that, um, uh, and I see William Wolf just left. I was going to like, uh, don't leave yet, William. I need <laughs> your help. He's going to the bathroom. So He's going to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> but basically, uh, Stephen Wolf's book, The Case for Christian Nationalism, was an incredibly clarifying book in so many ways. And reading it and seeing the reaction shows that he really put his finger on some important distinctions that how you come down on those fundamentally affects how you view and act in the world. Like one of the things he exposed, I think, is that most evangelicals essentially believe God's created order has been completely marred, destroyed, and that nature is totally corrupt. And that without some sort of common grace, without some sort of grace of God, every single thing we did would be some sort of evil, terrible, et cetera. And they have a very, very poor view of creation as it exists today. And um, uh, which, you know, Stephen Wolf, of course, has a very high view of creation. And one of the debates about that book, I think, has come down has been, uh, uh, you know, he's Presbyterian, and a lot of the Baptists, kind of the contemporary Baptist thinkers, have really been puking all over this idea of, uh, of po- cr- Christian and politics. And you even get guys like Russell Moore saying it's like, it's actually better, he's essentially saying it's better to live in a society where Christians are persecuted because. That way, nobody is like falsely believed into thinking they're saved or something like that. And I'm like, man, you know, there is something to the way that the contemporary American Baptists conceive of the relationship between Christianity, society, the state, and the family that undermines Christian political action. I, I say William, we got to have William because he would dispute this is authentically the Baptist approach. And if you, you know, originally this was not. This is, this is Anabaptist, it's not Baptist. And I'm not going to speak for all the Baptists, but I do think, like, the significance of, of infant baptism is more than just, like, oh, it's a the, you know, theological point. It also affects everything about how you view the society and the relationship between the Christian and the citizen. Christians, you know, a citizenship of the church, citizenship of the state. And um, so I do think that these things, a lot of these things are much more significant than we think. And one reason that, it's, it's very obvious that one reason Christians don't hold any influence or power in these organizations is because their theologies basically delegitimize that. And so you can't neglect those fundamental arguments because they have practical applications, not just, it's not just an abstract theological point like how many angels yeah. dance on the head of a pin. It has, they have, they actually, they actually have real implications for how we live life in the world and conduct our affairs. That's great. Let's let Aaron have had the last word since it was his talk. Give a round of applause, please, for our panelists.